Not so sure. Okay, welcome everybody. This is the session for the Karen Spark Jones Award, uh, in particular the recipient's uh, talk. My name is uh, Jochen Leitner. I'm the chair of this session and uh, it is an honor to be chairing this award. Uh, and I would like to thank on behalf of the British Computing Society uh, and its information retrieval specialist group, the following groups. Microsoft Research for sponsoring the Karen Spark Jones Award. Thanks uh, a lot for making this award possible, not just for one year, but for several years already. Uh, thanks to the independent selection judges that uh, picked the winner uh, this year and, and in previous years. And of course, thanks to the wonderful ECIR 2021 organizers uh, for hosting this award talk. Uh, this year, unfortunately, virtually for uh, uncontrollable reasons. Uh, I guess we all wish we could be in Luca with you guys, uh, but it has to be like that for everybody's safety. And uh, yeah, that brings us to why we are here. Uh, Karen Spark Jones, uh, whom I was uh, honored to call also my uh, computer science professor when I was a student, lived from 1935 to 2007. And she was actually trained as a history teacher and briefly even worked uh, as that profession. But uh, her real passion was was in different areas. So she, she ended up going into computing and uh, that was perhaps supported by also having a bit of a, a a philosophical background. So she worked at the University of Cambridge uh, what in what was uh, called the Mathematical Laboratory, uh, which later became the Computer Laboratory and is, is now uh, the Department for Computer Science and Technology at the University of Cambridge. And uh, she is most well known as the mother of DFIDF, uh, her paper introducing inverse document brackets collection frequency published in the journal of uh, documentation 1972 really revolutionized information retrieval you are not the audience i need to tell this to but it is still good to advertise her work as you know an early uh, woman technologist uh, women in technology still don't have it easy and we need to support their cause and karen was quite uh, emphasizing that and supporting women in technology. And her paper from that day, so the paper is roughly as old as I am, still relevant today. I just checked this morning and it's got 445 citations in the year 2020. Uh, I think that's, that's a remarkable uh, way of not showing one's age. And in the same way that Karen did not show her, her real age, so she uh, kept a sharp mind uh, till till her sad uh, uh, passing uh, uh, in in 2007. So the reason why we want to remember her is uh, not just uh, her uh, computer science research contributions, but also uh, the role she had in in supporting others, in particular women in technology and the Microsoft. Uh, uh, kindly sponsors this award and we want to remind the audience of this talk also that if you know or supervise uh, young people uh, who are just after their PhD within the first 10 years of their PhD, please bring on uh, these smart people and uh, support your applications uh, for future Karen Spark Jones Awards if you have rising stars uh, in your own group or in a neighboring groups so or if you know somebody. And in particular, I would like to encourage people also from outside of um, information retrieval proper. Karen was also very active in natural language processing. So we want to define you know, research in our field uh, very inclusively uh, and, and in particular also singling out you know, women and, and under underrepresented groups to also uh, be nominated by by people like you who are in the audience right now. So with that, 
I'm getting a bit of a funny picture here. Um, I would like to welcome Dr. Ahmed uh, Hussein Abadala, uh, who did his PhD at the University of Michigan with a focus on modeling conversations, I believe. He was then a research engineer at IBM Cairo in Egypt and has then joined Microsoft Research in Redmond, Washington, uh, and has remained there for about the last decade, where he is now in a senior principal research manager function, I believe. And uh, in the short period from 2006 until today, he has amassed uh, over 100 uh, publications, patent applications. Uh, they range from uh, journals to conference publications in NLP, IR, machine learning. Um, and I believe today we will uh, learn about uh, difficult circumstances when you don't have a, a lot of data. And uh, his uh, Google Scholar entry, which is probably un incomplete because uh, these automatic systems uh, can never capture everything, lists about 3,600 plus citations. And it is remarkable that about 710 of these are also from 2020, from last year. Uh, so without further ado, um, Ahmed, it is a, uh, an honor to, to have you here and uh, great to, for you to speak uh, to this ECIR audience. Uh, thanks for coming and uh, welcome to your award. Uh, very well deserved indeed. And I'll just share here and hand over to you. you, you Thank you so much. Able. Thank you so much, Johan, for the uh, kind introduction. Uh, it's an honor to receive an award commemorating Karen Sparks Jones. And I'd like to thank the British Computing Society, the IRSCG, and ECIR. Uh, for choosing me to receive this award, as well as for the opportunity to speak uh, about my work to everyone today. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, thank you. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much again. Uh, and uh, today I am going to be speaking about some of the work I have been doing with several of my colleagues uh, about learning uh, with limited labeled data and specifically uh, the role user interaction can do uh, to help us in such limited situations. But before we start, let's briefly talk about the uh, notion of information overload that has been discussed significantly in the information access and management space. The amount of information that a typical information worker needs to handle has been always increasing over the past several years. From your documents to your slides, to your emails and your calendar, if you are a developer, then you also have your code reviews and your bugs. If you are a salesperson, you have your sales lead and customer interaction and so on and so forth. This information is constantly increasing, and this has been amplified significantly recently by the accelerated digitization that our society has been witnessing, making it very hard to be productive as we interact with and access this information. Now let's go back in time to 1988, uh, where I uh, got the pleasure a while back to read uh, this very interesting paper from Karen Sparks Jones titled A Look Back and A Look Forward. In this paper, Karen was describing uh, and portraying what she thinks an ideal information access and management system should do. And she's describing a system that's multifaceted in nature, that can bring together different types of information objects and supports different information uses. She envisioned that the system will have a common command framework where we can interface with any functionality using natural language. She also envisioned a system where the user can be able to edit and publish documents, submit queries to a database in natural language, send and receive email, and organize their schedule. Now, fast forward 30 plus years later, surprisingly, we are not really there yet. We still do not have that integrated personalized information management system. However, we have made progress in several ways. 
by creating different applications that support some of these functionalities, ranging from database queries in natural language, support in writing and sending emails and managing schedules and accessing documents, among many other things. At the core of many of these applications is the ability to understand and process natural language. And the reason is most of this contents are in natural language or mostly linguistic objects. And also in many cases, the experiences use a natural language interface to allow to us to interact with some of these sources. And recent advances in deep learning over the past several years have completely changed the way we have been doing natural language processing. They allowed us to reach previously unattainable performance. Their applicability to a wide range of tasks has been pushing us forward in terms of which tasks we can address. They eliminated the need for feature engineering by this end-to-end -end framing where the feature extraction is done implicitly as we are training the model. And even more so over the past couple of years, the field has been dominated with a few architectures, even eliminating the need of thinking about which architecture we should be using. However, what they could not eliminate yet is the need for massive amounts of hand-labeled training data to fine-tune these models for, our, for any given task. What you see here on the screen is a graph showing on the x-axis the size of training data needed for one of the GLUE benchmark tasks, and on the y-axis the corresponding performance. And this is after fine-tuning a large breed train model such as BERT. And while you could see that you can impressively get to around 70 uh, point performance with just a few hundreds of labeled instances, to really get to good enough performance for a real application, you need to have access to tens or hundreds of thousands of labeled data. You can also see that if you have a look at some of the reader boards of uh, the NLP benchmarks, this is a snapshot from the Super Glue benchmark reader boards a few weeks ago. And while you could see that current systems are performing so well on that benchmark, and achieving performance on par with what a human annotator can achieve, they are still actually using a lot of labeled data to get to that performance. Contrast that with the performance of a model that's uh, operating in a few shot settings where it only assumes access to a smaller amount of labeled data. And even though this is one of the biggest models out there with billions of with hundreds of billions of parameters, there is still a significant gap between that and the best state-of-the-art performance. And the difference between this is how much annotated data is available. So if we are interested in bringing these information access and management tasks at a scale to everyone, how much annotated data do we really need? Assume that we are interested in supporting around 100 tasks, and each task actually doesn't require that much data, maybe tens of thousands of labeled instances. But we are interested in bringing that experience to many markets and languages and domains. So we have maybe 100 languages that we would like to support in 1,000 different organizations. We will see that the numbers start adding up pretty quickly, and we are faced with the need of collecting hundreds of billions of labels. This is not only cost prohibitive and very hard to achieve, but in some situations, it's not even possible because of restrictions around access and privacy of the data. And this is especially relevant when we think about information access and management application because the data tends to be very personal and very private in nature. Now let's take a step back and think about the World Wide Web and how search engines have been doing a great job in organizing and making this data accessible to us. At a very large scale, we have trillions of pages and a billion of queries processed per day, and we have been seamlessly being able to access information on the web. One reason why search engines have been doing so well in organizing this data and getting us access to it is that search engines have had done a great job in effectively leveraging user interaction. They see the queries that people enter and the results that they click, and then they use that data to get better and better iteratively and continuously. 
And the amount of data being collected have been ranging from queries to utterances in voice search to clicks to dwell time. And in even some applications and studies, more detailed interactions such as keystrokes and gaze pattern and many more. And the information retrieval community has been actually paying a lot of attention to this notion of leveraging user interaction to create and improve systems for many, many years. You see a lot of very influential work on learning from implicit feedback using clicks and other signals as an implicit feedback signal to train ranking systems. You could also see even work on positioning the information retrieval problem as an interactive problem where the user interacts with the system iteratively in multiple iterations till they satisfy their information need. And you would see that very influential work in this area has been happening as back as the 90s and way before with the work of Spink and Pelkin and others. In a sense, what these applications have been doing is that they have been creating a feedback loop where users interacting with the experiences and these interactions are used to create additional data that can be used to improve that system. Contrast that with the traditional supervised learning setup where we start by collecting label data, we apply our supervised training and learning techniques to create a model, and then we deploy the model, the user interacts with the model, and that's it. To close that loop, we can leverage this user interaction and use an expert or developer who has a domain knowledge about our, our application to automatically create new training data based on this interaction. And this new training data could augment existing data to retrain the system. This process happens offline and the modeling step is treated as a closed box with that iteratively repeated every time we have more data to train the models better and better. This is sometimes referred to as weekly supervised learning because now we are not only using the trust, trusted label data, but we are also using automatically generated label data that might be weak or noisy in certain aspects that we will talk about later. But yet another approach is to actually change the way the models behave such that they not only generate predictions based on inputs, but they can also reason about their uncertainty and explain their actions and predictions to the user. The user can then review the explanations and interact with the model to correct mistakes or refine their intents. In this case, the interaction is actually happening in an online manner with an open box assumption around how the model is actually operating. And this is very similar to the interactive IR work framing that I was talking about earlier. In the remainder of this talk, I will describe work in these two directions and then discuss open problems and outstanding challenges that we should be focusing on to make even more progress. So let's start with the notion of weekly supervised learning, specifically as it pertains to leveraging user interactions. In traditional supervision, the sources of the supervision signal could be hand labeled data or could even be explicit feedback that comes in the form of likes and dislikes and thumbs up, thumbs down, say in a recommendation application. This data tends to be clean and trusted labels, but tends to also be very expensive and limited in volume. On the other hand, weekly supervised data could come from different sources. Some of it could be heuristics about the data itself or implicit feedback signals. In a search application, this could be clicks, this could be dwell time, in an information management system about your email, this could be signals around responding to your email or reading time of your email. They tend to be cheaper to collect and easier to collect in much larger volumes, especially for deployed systems at large scale. However, the labels are by definition noisy and in many cases inaccurate. And that poses several challenges. So let's talk about the first one. The fact that these labels are noisy in nature. And that makes using them hard. And to better understand that, let's look at uh, this experiment that was reported in, similar experiments was reported in multiple studies, but we will talk about one from the Sultano Qudabi et al. work from a couple of years ago. 
And the experiment is trying to quantify why working with noisy labels could be challenging specifically for large scale deep learning models. What the authors did here is that they took the MNIST data set, a data set for digit recognition, and they started corrupting some of the labels at different percentages. So at 25% corruption, maybe one in each, uh, in every four samples, the label of that would be corrupted. In that case, the label of the image of the zero digit ended up receiving an eight label instead of the zero label. So they vary the corruption level from 0%, meaning no corruption, to 100%, meaning all the labels are random. And they started training a large deep learning model on them. Looking at the blue curve in this figure, this curve is showing the accuracy on the training set. And surprisingly, no matter how much corruption you do, no matter how much noise you inject, the model is able to fit and memorize the noise and performs very well on the training set that's in that case corrupted. However, its performance on the non-corrupted test set or even the original non-corrupted training set tends to degrade significantly as you add more and more corruption. And this is one of the main challenges with working with weak labels, specifically when you have such a large model. But we don't always only have weak label data. Sometimes we also have some clean trusted label data. So maybe just combining them could help. And it probably does, but the naive way of just combining them by concatenating them and training on the combination of them doesn't seem to work for many cases. And specifically as the noise level increases or as the size of the weak noisy data gets much larger than the size of the clean data. You would see this figure here from some of one, uh, one of our experiments on some of the applications we have been working with an email classification task in this case. And you would see that just combining the clean and the weak data, specifically when the weak data is much larger than the clean data, could actually end up hurting the overall performance, or at best not performing at bar or else slightly better than using the clean data alone. So how to best leverage the weak data then, specifically in situation where we do have access to some clean data. Ideally, we should be able to use the clean data as a grounding signal to guide how we can use the weak data. This grounding could happen by using the clean data to help us select or assign weights to different weak data instances such that we follow the assumption that not all weak data is equal, not all of it is useful for our modeling. So we might be able to select which ones are useful or assign higher weights to the ones that are likely to be more useful. Or we can even go a step further and try to change the noisy label distribution, replacing the hard noisy label with a soft label distribution that might help us correct some of the noise inherent in the data. And there are multiple ways to do that, but one of the very interesting ways is following the learning to learn paradigm, which has been used significantly in the meta-learning literature, which has been gaining a lot of attention over the past couple of years. The idea is to try to train the models in a way that it actually learns how it can learn the objective function you are interested in. In that specific application, our model has access to both the clean label data and the weak label data. And we are actually training two models concurrently. The main model, which is trying to perform the original task, and a meta model. The meta model in that case is trying to take in the noisy label data as input and alter their label distribution. But we do not have any data to directly train the meta model because we never see instances of inputs where we have the noisy label and the clean label at the same time. However, we can employ this notion of bi-level optimization, traditionally used in, in meta-learning, to allow us to train the meta-model such that it helps the main model the most. This bi-level optimization is basically trying to minimize the loss of the trained main model on the clean data, such that the trained meta model minimizes that training loss on the transformed weekly label data. And this is an end-to-end -end differentiable model where the gradients are flowing backward from the main model to the meta model. 
So in, in, in a sense, we are indirectly training the meta model such that it provides the best possible data to train the main model. And these approaches tend to actually work pretty well. And what you see here on the screen is three different cases where the meta model is able to convert the hard noisy label into a soft label distribution. In the first case, the noisy label is actually correct. And the meta model decides to continue to assign it higher probability, indicating its confidence in the correctness of that noisy label. But in the other two cases, the noisy label was actually not correct. And in that case, the meta model is actually altering the label distribution in a way that assigns less confidence in the noisy label and tries to shift some of the probability distribution to other classes that might be the correct label. And when you actually apply that in multiple set and multiple data sets for image classification, for text classification, you actually see that a good meta model could actually enrich the training set with labels corrected from the weak noisy labels, leading to a better overall predictive model. However, these are results based on simulated noise, based on uh, diff diff based on existing benchmarks in image and text spaces. So let's actually talk about a real application where the noisy data is coming from user interaction. The application here is email classification and the weak labels can easily be collected from so many signals because people are interacting at large scale with the email management system. The weak labels could be derived from signals such as reading an email, opening an email, responding to an email, flagging an email, the amount of time you spend reading an email and so many more. So using these weak labels as a way to indicate whether an email is important or not is actually a very good source of weak labels based on how people are interacting with the information. And you would see that the red curve here is indicating how we can combine the clean and the weak data with the clean data acting as a grounding signal to guide us into how to best use the weak data. And we can achieve much better performance than using the clean data alone or than approaches that would just naively combine the clean and the weak data on multiple tasks in the email classification space. The second challenge, if you recall when I was talking about the email application right now, I listed the large number of criteria and signals and heuristics that can indicate that an email is important. So we talked about responding to an email, we talked about the amount of time you spend reading an email, and all of these could be signals indicating that an email is important. But mapping each one of them to a label could be straightforward, but aggregating all of them into a single label is usually done in a very ad hoc manner. On the other hand, if we just assume that we have multiple sources of weak labels, so for every n instance, we have multiple labels at the same time, this could retain the additional information each uh, rule or each signal is trying to project. However, aggregating them tends to be hard, specifically in cases where they might disagree and conflict. But using a very similar approach to what I just described, you can, uh, you can also use this notion of co-training multiple models at the same time, where in that case, one of the models is trying to do heuristic source aggregation or rule aggregation, and the other model is the main model. And the rule aggregation model is basically taking in multiple weak labels at the same time and trying to decide what's the best way to aggregate them dynamically at the n instance level, reflecting the confidence of the model on each weak label in, in context of the current input. And the rule aggregation, rule attention network, the way it does that is that it decides to basically assign weights or pay different attention to different rules. But the model does that dynamically dependent on the input because not universally assigning a weight to each uh, weak source, but uh, taking the assumption that some weak sources might be more reliable for different types of input at different uh, contexts and hence trying to do that assignment of rule attention or rule weight dynamically uh, as the model is being trained. 
And you would see that in this uh, hypothetical example here, where we are seeing an example when we have only have two rules or two weak sources. When the rules disagree, the model actually learns that to minimize the main model loss, it needs to assign one of them a higher weight and one of them the lower weight. But in cases where rules do agree, the loss is minimal actually when high weights are assigned uh, to both of the models simultaneously. In a sense, the model is learning to aggregate rules with trainable weights that would capture their fidelity for each instance it sees. And on a number of benchmark data, this actually works pretty well. And it performs much better than uh, doing majority vote across all of them or using the labeled data only or different ways of combining the weak sources that do not take into consideration how to dynamically aggregate them. And like before, this results on benchmark data. So let's actually look at a real application. In that case, the application is fake news detection uh, using two data sets for fake news detection right here and deriving weak labels from how people are interacting with the news. The, there has been a lot of literature on trying to uh, correlate certain human behavior when interacting with news and confidence in uh, uh, whether this news is a reliable source or not. That literature has identified signals around sharing and comment and commenting and the sentiments of the comments and many more signals as potential weak sources of labels uh, for that particular task. And you see here uh, the red curve on top is showing how we can aggregate the different sources together in a way that allows us to learn from the weak labels and the clean labels where we have multiple sources of weak labels at the same time. And it's performing uh, pretty well in that case. So now let's switch gears a little bit and uh, try to start thinking about interactive learning from the feedback or the interaction signal. So far, we have been talking about a scenario where a developer or an expert who has domain knowledge would come in and leverage knowledge of the how people interact with a system or a data and try to derive weak labels that can be used to create this virtual cycle of retraining the model. However, that's not the only way to leverage human interaction and human feedback. An alternative way could be by building interactive system that can enable fast progressive interactions, allowing the human to collaborate with the model to complete a complex task. We refer to this as an open box setup because we are changing how the model is behaving. The model is not only taking an input and generating an output, but the model now is actually doing the prediction and then reasoning about its certainty or uncertainty in the prediction to decide whether it needs to seek feedback from the end user or not, and to enable the human to actually provide feedback. The model might need to explain the action or the prediction back to the user. The user in this case will have to review these explanations and then interact by providing feedback. And the feedback could be trying to fix mistakes or fix uh, errors that the model has made in the way it came up with the prediction, or could even be refining the user's own intent or specification of the problem. So to make that uh, a little less abstract, let's actually think about a specific application. And in that particular case, we will think about building natural language interfaces to data. This has been a problem that have been very well studied for many, many years. Actually, the pursuit of using language as a universal interface to interact with data and services has been the holy grail of human computer interaction, information, access, natural language understanding for many, many decades. And you see many influential work dating back to the 70s and the 80s, trying to think about how to create natural language interfaces to knowledge bases and to databases. Over the past several years, the interest in these applications has been growing significantly, specifically because we have so many applications from digital assistance to database querying systems to question answering system to interaction with robots and Internet of Things that is putting a lot of demand on such technology. And also because the technology that we use for understanding languages has been improving significantly, getting us to a point where we can build usable end-to-end -end systems based on these applications. 
At the core of the problem of natural building a natural language interface is what's commonly referred to as the semantic parsing problem, which is the task of converting a natural language utterance to some logical form. The logical form is intended to be a machine understanding representation of the meaning of the utterance. And the logical form can take on many formats. It can be in the form of an SQL query or an API call to a web API or a semantic frame or so many more formats. The comment between them is that they are machine understandable representations of the utterance that the human gives. So traditional semantic parsing poses that problem as a one-shot translation of an utterance to a corresponding logical form. So in that case, if the user is querying a database uh, of locations and is trying to identify all the location whose name contains a certain word, the semantic parsing system will take that natural language utterance and generate a corresponding logical form. In that particular case, we are showing the logical form in, S in the form of an SQL query. But what happens when the system gets it wrong? So in that particular case, you would see that the user is actually interested in identifying the location. And the system decided to return the address of the location. But maybe the user didn't really want the address of the location, but just the names of the location, because the underlying table had a name identifying each location. In that particular case, when the system gets strong, the only recourse for the user would be to start again from scratch and try to ask this question in a different way. Or even if we are allowing the user to provide feedback in the forms of binary sums up, sums down feedback, the only feedback the system will get back is that it got the interpretation wrong and that it needs to try again but we are not telling the system anyway about how to, what, the, what the problem is or how to actually solve the problem. Contrast that with if you are asking that question to a human, you wouldn't necessarily, if the human gets the answer wrong, you would not just like repeat the question again from scratch. You will not give them thumbs up, thumbs down. You will actually try to explain to them what did they do wrong. You can, for example, say that address is wrong. I actually want the names of these locations. And a human will definitely benefit from this information significantly and correct the interpretation of your original questions and hopefully uh, satisfy the information needs that you have. So what if we can allow semantic parsing system to do that? What if instead of having a one-shot scenario, we can have a loop around this one-shot scenario where we can provide corrections when the system makes a mistake? And the corrections could be provided in multiple ways, but for now, let's assume that we will provide corrections in open form natural language. And the correction will be a feedback that the system could use in order to correct the mistakes that it has made. It turns out that building the systems in such an interactive way versus the standard way, where again, the only recourse when the system gets it wrong would be for the user to start again from scratch and try to formulate the question in a different way, it turns out that such interactive ways in user studies are showing to be much more effective for satisfying information needs. In that particular case, we are comparing success rate or completion rate, the amount of tasks that a user is actually able to successfully complete, and also the time to completion, how much time it takes in order to complete them. And we would see that the interactive system is doing much better than the standard system, specifically when the tasks get harder and harder, because that increases the likelihood that the model will make mistakes. And hence, this interactivity to work around fixing these mistakes tends to come in very handy. So the way to do that would be to frame the semantic parsing problem as a semantic parsing correction with natural language feedback problem. Traditionally, we are trying to take an utterance and generate the logical form, but now in subsequent turns, we might have actually a context in the form of an utterance and the initial uh, interpretation of it and a feedback. And the problem would be given that feedback, how could we actually generate the correct interpretation? There are very few data sets that allow us actually to study such interactive open form settings, if any. 
uh, and not only in semantic parsing, but generally in machine learning in general. So for the semantic parsing problem, we decided to start with an existing one-shot semantic parsing data set, very large cross-domain data set, where we actually have the logical form in the form of SQL queries. And we took a state-of-the-art at the time parser and applied it to this data set and identified all the mispredicted SQLs and then developed a way to explain this interpretation to a user. Because remember that we, the, the semantic parsing system are not assuming that the user would be able to understand the logical form in its machine understandable format. So we need to explain it in a way that the user can actually understand. And once we explain it to the user, we ask the user to provide feedback, to collect, uh, to provide feedback, to try to correct any mistakes that have happened. To explain the SQL, we actually experiment with using a combination of template matching and text generation to try to uh, use that templatization to identify certain structures of the logical form and generate text in order to explain it. Once we are able to explain the text in natural language, users are actually able to understand the logical form and are able to comment on what went wrong with it. And it was very interesting to see what types of feedback are humans providing in that case. So let's look at some of them. In many cases, the output of the system had a problem. Either the system was generating an undesired output. So the system is you are querying about a person and you just want their addresses and the person is returning their physical address and their email address and you don't really want the email address. But more importantly, there were cases where the output is missing or completely wrong. So in that case, one feedback was, I also need the number of different services where the system was returning the names of the services, but not the number of them, or the system was returning one property in return of another property, and it was the wrong property. So a large class of feedback was trying to correct what data is the system returning back. The second large category was in conditions on identifying the information that the system needs. Recall this our queries on uh, tables. So a lot of the uh, uh, questions get mapped to doing different filtering operations on the table before returning the information the user is interested in. And in many cases where there was unneeded conditions that were added by mistake or missing conditions that should have been added. And the last category is errors around aggregation. So the user is interested in getting the results in a certain order or getting only the unique values or aggregating by getting the maximum value or the minimum value and the system was making mistakes with some of these. Another interesting way to look at the feedback is the degree of completeness of the feedback. And completeness here was defined by whether the feedback is describing all the mistakes that should be fixed in the interpretation or not. So in that particular case, there was only one mistake with the interpretation is that the system was returning the counts that are greater than or equal to two. And the question was looking only for, uh, uh, for values that, that, should, not use, that should, not, uh, should not use greater than. And in that particular case, the feedback is deemed as complete. And in the majority of cases, the feedback was actually complete, meaning that it was describing how to fix all the problems with the interpretation. But in some cases, the feedback was only partial, meaning that it's only describing a subset of the problem. And it was very interesting to go back and look at these mistakes and see why the user opted for doing that, because we were, there were no instructions instructing the user to provide feedback in different ways. And interestingly, what happened in these cases is that when the user identified more than one problem with the interpretation, they would implicitly identify the biggest problem and try to provide feedback to fix that, which is lending itself naturally to an interactive way where the user could be fixing one problem at a time. But there were a few cases where the system made a major mistake in a way that it was very hard to describe what went wrong because so many things went wrong. And in that case, the user, and again, without being instructed, opted for falling back to the original setup where they would just try to ask the question again from scratch, just reformulate the query similar to what we see in search engine. Now, if we 
look at the problem not from the feedback human perspective, but from actually the difference in the what we call here the source, the incorrect interpretation, and the target, the correct interpretation. We actually see that most differences could be easily described by an edit that you could apply to the source to generate the target. And we came up with this edit framing just to try to understand the distance between the source and the target. So an edit could basically be remove the max operator and add the average operator instead, or the edit could be add the column ID to the order by clause. If we identify the number of edits between the correct and the incorrect interpretation and plot them in a histogram like that, we observe that very interestingly that the majority of them have very small number of edits. Actually, in like more than 50% of the cases, there was only one or two edits that needed to happen to make the correction. And this aligns back with the uh, uh, observation we were making earlier is that most of the mistakes are minor and can be actually fixed if the user was provided an affordance to continue to interact with the system. Given that edit framing, you could actually position this problem as a learning to edit problem, where given uh, feedback coming from a human interacting with the system, how can you generate a machine readable form of that feedback in the form of a list of edits that we can take and apply uh, to the uh, incorrect interpretation deterministically to correct mistakes in it. Traditionally, many of the semantic parsing problems in the recent uh, couple of years are being positioned as a sequence to sequence problem where you have an encoder decoder architecture. The encoder is only encoding the question and the decoder is generating the logical form. The learning from feedback problem could follow that, but now the encoder is much richer. It's not only encoding the question, it's taking the original question and its incorrect interpretation as context and it's taking the feedback provided by the user and trying to generate a list of edits to correct the interpretation based on that feedback. And it turns out that doing this could actually significantly help the user. In more than 41% of the mistakes can be fully corrected after a single round of interaction. And 72% of the mistakes can be partially corrected after a single round of interaction. And learning to generate edits in that way tends to do much better than other methods that would try to regenerate the interpretation from scratch. Because when we try to regenerate from scratch, we are throwing away some of the context that we already have. Or methods that do not use the feedback and only use the signal that the current interpretation is incorrect. And the best you could do is to try to do, go down the beam and try to generate another interpretation, maybe the second best interpretation and provide it to the user. Note that so far we have been assuming that the only way the user will be able to interact with the system and give feedback is by giving natural language open form feedback. While natural language is a very powerful way to provide feedback, it's not necessarily the only way or not even necessarily the right way in, in each case. So in that follow-up study, that we were studying how to create this form of a debug it yourself interface where we can, like before, generate the interpretation of the utterance, explain the interpretation in a way that the user could understand, but Solicit feedback not only in the form of open form natural language, but build a user interface with a lot of graphical user interface control that allows for more fine grained interaction and more deterministic interactions as well. These types of interaction could actually be easier for the user to do. However, they are, they tend to be a very specific to the logical form. So if our logical form is different, we might have to build a slightly different interface. And users seem to be receiving these types of interaction very well, actually. In a user study with many users, users were given pretty good feedback, uh, indicating that uh, such interfaces were easy to use, that they were able to interact with the system in a very useful way, and that they are able to correct their mistakes with such an interface. There is a lot of uh, open work remaining here in thinking about how to build these interfaces in a more generalized way to cover many semantic parsing problems, but even problems beyond semantic parsing as well, and many ways to try to more naturally combine the open form feedback 
with the uh, graphical user interface needs the interaction for collecting feedback. So now to, to recall what we have been talking about so far, we have been talking about the notion of trying to establish these virtual cycles that allow the user to provide interactions and feedback that we can use to improve the systems. So in the few minutes I have left, I will quickly recap what we discussed, and then I will spend some time talking about challenges and open problems. So to recap, we talked about the hand-labeled training data bottleneck in machine learning and how even for the biggest and the best modeling techniques we have out there, we still require large amounts of hand-labeled training data in order to reach satisfactory performance. If our objective is to bring intelligent experiences and real practical applications to many markets and languages and domains and tasks, that becomes a very challenging problem. Because when we are thinking about benchmark data set, we always have a lot of data to work with. But we are thinking about how to build real applications. I talked mostly about information management and access application, but there could be many other classes of applications where getting such hand-labeled data at scale is very hard and in many cases infeasible. And finally, we talked about the role of user interaction in this process and how we can use user interaction with experiences as a way to generate additional sources of supervision to improve these experiences. And there are many, many ways of doing that. We talked about only two ways. One is trying to iteratively retrain the models by using interaction data as a source of weak supervision. So an expert, a domain expert or a developer of the model would actually examine the system, the user interactions, and try to come up with ways to generate additional labeled data based on the user interaction. And that labeled data could be used to retrain the model. And the cycle is happening here at the level of retraining the model over and over again, every time we have more interaction. We also talked about this more open box online uh, interaction way where we can start thinking about how to actually build the systems in a way that they are not a single shot setup, but they can predict and then reason about uncertainty, explain the prediction, seek feedback, and leverage the feedback in, uh, instantaneously to improve. But there are so many challenges ahead of us as we think about how to continue to make progress in terms of using interaction data to improve our systems. The first challenge is that collecting interaction data is pretty hard. In that classification that, that Susan Dume uh, uh, described in, in, a in a keynote speech in Kai a few years ago, she was describing the different types of ways of settings of collecting interaction data, ranging from lab studies to panel studies to log studies, and also different types of experiments, either observational or experimental. And while each one of them have different settings and different advantages, every one of them also have different limitations. And when you are doing lab studies, you have a lot of control in terms of what do you observe and what do you collect. But at the same time, you have very small scale. As you move toward increasing the scale, you end up losing that control and trying to find the sweet spot where you maintain control and collect data at scale and collect representative data and think about designing interfaces and logging techniques to collect the data is definitely a very open challenging problem. But even once we collect the label data, reducing the label data, the interaction data into weak labels that we can work with is also pretty hard. Because it requires significant domain knowledge and significant amount of time. And in many ways, it's done in a very ad hoc way. For example, in web search, we know that a click with a dual time of say longer than 30 seconds is usually a, a good signal for saying that a query and a document might be relevant. But how do we do that at scale for so many applications, for so many user interfaces? There has been recent advances in this concept known as data programming, where auto systems are built to create automatic labeling functions based on the data itself, uh, based on characteristics of the data, such as features that we know about the data or heuristic rules that we know about the data. Extending this paradigm in order to incorporate interaction data in a way that allows domain experts or AI developers to use them to create weak labels could be a very good direction moving forward. 
But finally, even if we have a way to collect the interaction data, map them to weak label data, working with the weak labels is still pretty tricky. Because after all, they are weak for a reason. They are weak because they are not accurate or they are not complete or they are not exact mapping between the tasks that we are interested in and the weak labels that we are generating. And we talked about some of these challenges earlier, but there remain to be a lot more challenges in modeling them. And some of the challenges that we didn't talk about is the challenges around bias and distribution shifts. And this could be manifested in many, many different ways. When you are collecting interaction data, there is definitely presentation bias. And actually, the information retrieval literature have been studying that significantly for the web search applications. For many other applications, there are such forms of biases that we need to start thinking about how to model collectively as well. But there is also other biases. There are population biases. There are biases related in the distribution shifts and related to which people will be providing this interaction signal, whether they map to the same populations that will be using the system or not, and many more other challenges. So that was the flavor of using interaction data to provide weak labels. We also talked about the notion of trying to go beyond the single shot view of AI system where we are building the interactivity into the system such that the user is able to iteratively refine their specification of the problem and provide instantaneous feedback for the system to leverage. And deep learning has been excelling in many tasks such as face recognition, speech recognition, and in many of these tasks, you see that the human can recognize faces and voices pretty easily, but we do not have a way of articulating this knowledge explicitly. There are also other tasks that require decision-making at very high speeds beyond the human capability, like if you're building an autonomous driving system and you're making thousands of decisions uh, per second, it might be hard to be able to provide, to interactively provide feedback from the human back to the system. But if we start thinking about other applications, such as an agent that's trying to assist you with writing an email or finding information in a database, there is a lot more room here for including the human in the loop of the decision making of the system by allowing the human and the affordance to provide feedback such that it can correct the mistakes that the system is making and refine the intent of the com for complex tasks. Finally, NLB evaluation is hard. And when we make the system interactive, it becomes even harder. And, and we conclude here again by looking at uh, one of the uh, papers by uh, Karen Spark Jones and, and uh, galleries in the mid 90s, where they were surveying the state of the art for evaluating natural language processing systems. And it's amazing how all of these things were relevant in the 90s and they are still as relevant today. The conclusion of the study was, uh, how the authors describe that evaluating machine, NLB system is pretty hard. And it's like advancing between Scylla and Charybdis. And if you are like me, you're not on top of your Greek mythology. Uh, Scylla and Charybdis are two monsters sitting opposite to on opposite side of a narrow street. And advancing between them is a very dangerous affair. And they are comparing that to the dangers of NLB evaluation. And they go on and list these dangers in very, very specific ways. So some of them are the fact that we always seek to apply closed problem approaches, exemplified by using metrics like blue score or word error rate or accuracy outside of how the system is actually being used. And that danger always resulted in a mismatch between how we evaluate the system and how our users will end up using the system. Another danger is that we tend to attach very high importance to specific sets of labels and data sets for evaluation, which again, might not be very reflective of the actual use of the system. And finally, as we increase the emphasis on interaction, we end up getting less and less repeatability, making evaluating these systems much harder. And the paper 
in its conclusion also talks about how other fields, specifically fields like information retrieval, have been thinking very, very hard about the evaluation problem in many ways and reaching a lot of conclusions about how that, how that there is no easy way of evaluating a system and how you cannot take the user and the context of which the system will be used away of the equation when you are system, thinking about even offline evaluation of your system. And evaluating NLP system in general, specifically these interactive systems that learn from user interaction remains a wide open challenge. And it was a challenge when it's described here in the 1995, and it still remains uh, such an important challenge today as well. Finally, many thanks again to the British Computing Society and the uh, Information Retrieval Specialists Group and ECIR for the honor of receiving this year's Karen Spark Jones Award and for inviting me to speak here today. And thanks also to all the amazing mentors, colleagues, and collaborators I have had the fortune of working with over the past several years. And thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Ahmed, uh, for very inspiring talk. Um, so we do have time for questions. If you want to uh, raise your hand or even make it easy for us to, to paste your question in the chat, uh, then we can read them out for everybody. So there are multiple ways to ask questions. There are some viewers on YouTube because this is live streamed. So if you do want to speak, be aware you will be recorded just for transparency. Uh, and uh, you can always paste it in YouTube chat and the colleagues in the background that deal with the technology will copy it over here so that we can see it in this chat. And you can ask here in the ECIR chat uh, as well. So, Martin White, please. Thank you very much for a, a, a fascinating um, discourse. I actually now understand the difference between what weak signals are and how you have to try and process them. But one of my concerns about NLP is that we tend to look at English looking at English or German looking at German. And much of the world, people, particularly in businesses, are searching in their second language. So you may get someone in German searching in English because the content is in English, but he's framing the, the query in German. And I'm wondering how the weak signals in that situation may get rather mixed because the, the NLP underlying it is not aware, and um, I, I suspect, of the first, second, or maybe even third language of the person asking the question. Is the, uh, am I overstating this, or is this something that's another of the challenges to be addressed? Yeah, absolutely. I think it is, and I think I think this is definitely part of of. Uh, what I briefly refer to as distributional shifts, and distributional shifts could come from uh, difference in domains, but you can actually think of language and language proficiency as a domain, uh, meaning that when, when I am uh, searching in my native language or in a language I'm very comfortable with on my second language, the way I frame my questions might be very different than someone who is actually doing that in their native language. And these are manifested in uh, distributional shifts between the interaction data and the weak data that we could see from different segments of users and also different from uh, what we could see from manually clean data that we might have access to. So it's definitely uh, one of the problems. And the problem also could be manifested in the form of different domains, like meaning if, if it's a search system and the search system is now applied on personal data and I work in the technology space and you work in the energy space or in the uh, healthcare domain. So the way we frame queries, the way we write emails, the language that we are using for searching or the language that we are searching could actually be very different. And all of these are very challenging problems around the, how the domain shifts could make it even more challenging to think about modeling such data. Yeah, I noticed in one of your slides, you had um, zip as a location. And unless you've been to the US, you don't understand that zip is actually what in the UK we call a postcode. And therefore you've got to have a synonym transi transition there because you don't know where I'm searching from to be able to convert zip to postcode. Absolutely. 
But thank you very much. It was an excellent presentation. I'm sure Karen Spark Jones would have approved. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Martin. Um, another question from uh, Jose Medina, Turkey. Sorry if I pronounced that wrongly. Hello. Thank you very much for the presentation. So my question is, as you already know, there are many, uh, as I am working on semantic technologies, there are many techniques and many semantic resources, for example, Wikidata, Tbpedia, that are you used now to support tasks in NLP and that can provide ground knowledge for a variety of tasks. I ask how this can be used along with the techniques, for example, semantic similarity measures to ameliorate or to robustify the labeling of data sets. Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. And actually, there are two things I can say about that. One is that the, the broader notion of weak sources of data, the weak labels could come from so many sources. I will specifically focusing on uh, interaction data as a source of weak labels. But you could also think about explicit knowledge, uh, which is commonly sometimes referred to as distant supervision, where you basically uh, have knowledge in a structured format in a database or a knowledge base, and you can use that to derive uh, weak labels. So, uh, uh, some of the examples of that would be work on relation extraction and entity extraction, where we try to come up with ad hoc rules based on what we know about structured relations and entities that we know about to drive weak labels on unstructured data and then retrain the system. So that's one direction that's already happening. But looking forward, there is a lot more that could happen here. And actually, I'd recommend the recent uh, papers that showed up in the communication of the ACM uh, that was talking about the notion of tacit knowledge and explicit knowledge and how we can use explicit knowledge more and more in AI. And it was basically uh, referring to uh, the, the, I think the title of the paper was Bulani's Revenge on AI, where it was referring to uh, Michael Bulani was basically uh, describing how humans tend to have a lot of tacit knowledge that they cannot necessarily describe about many tasks and how a lot of the machine learning paradigms right now are basically trying to find patterns from pairs of inputs and outputs to infer connections between inputs and outputs in cases where humans do not have explicit knowledge to provide. But there is another class of tasks. So there's a ton of explicit knowledge, hard earned knowledge over so many years in the form of explicit knowledge in databases in the form of knowledge about processes and so on and so forth. And trying to incorporate this into the way we build modeling is definitely a very interesting problem that the community should pay much more attention to. There has been work trying to do that in different ways, especially around combining knowledge bases, fusing uh, information from knowledge bases and text. But I think there's a lot more that can be done in that space. Thank you. Thank you indeed. And we have a question on the chat. I will read it out. It's from Luis uh, Daniel Ibanez Gonzalez. Speaking about multimodal interfaces, do you know for what types of tasks they would be more appropriate with respect to keyword natural language only? In other words, where lies the border between the holy grail of a 100% natural language interface and example based approaches? Yeah, that, that, that's a very good question, and I, I, I'm, I'm not sure I would have an answer to that. It's definitely one of the things that we were discussing as we were doing this work, and we went between, well, th there are multiple ways to think about that. One is that it's not universal. It's not like for each application, keyword search versus fully natural language search versus spectrum between both. Uh, the treatment you have for each of these might be different, but even if we stick to uh, NL search or NL uh, interfaces, the example that we were talking about here, uh, it's not clear. We, we, we went between the extremes. We studied the fully free form feedback and we studied a particular interpretation of what we think multimodal interaction could look like. But the spectrum is very rich and there are so many other configurations that we could study. And they might be dependent on the application. They might be dependent on the logical that you are creating. So this is definitely one of the other open problems where I think we need to think a lot more about doing more and more studies to understand where do we fit in the spectrum given a specific application and a specific structured data format. 
Thank you very much for answering this one. Now, I, I have a question too. You had a really uh, good example where you uh, pointed out an error in the translation between natural language and SQL. It was greater or equal than two, and the person wanted to know exactly two. And now, if you've ever done this, translating SQL, uh, natural language to SQL, uh, which I have uh, done at, at times as well, you, you figure out it's actually quite difficult because sometimes you want an exact reading and sometimes greater or equal is actually the intended form. For example, I've played with restaurant searches and then you really want a restaurants that have two or more tables, not restaurants that have exactly two tables free because that would be an undercount and you know there's probably no such restaurant uh, and there may be tons that ac accommodate you and your friends uh, so is there any any list of such nasty cases and how often they impede this translation process has anybody uh, maybe kind of published anything like that are you aware of anything in this space uh, not just the quantifier problem but these little things that you need to know if you haven't worked in the field uh, that would trip you up and, and how much they contribute to failure of a system. So in other words, if you want to fix the important problems first, the ones that happen a lot, where would you start? Yeah, that's actually a very, very good question. And, and, and there are two angles to it that I can uh, briefly comment on. One is this notion of error analysis and how it's actually very important to go deep into the data set and understand the cases where the systems are failing. And uh, Un, un, unfortunately, uh, the, 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 if you go back, the, the database question answering space has been going on for many decades. And if you go back to a lot of the earlier work, you'd find a lot more attention to this notion of error analysis than you find right now. Except now there is definitely a lot of work doing that. But this is actually a good point just to emphasize the fact that uh, sometimes a benchmark driven mentality just like pushes people to try to optimize for the model to do better and better and summarize the performance in a single number without actually paying attention to the error cases. And if we are paying more attention to the error cases, we could do much better in terms of addressing them. And this is sometimes a discrepancy as well between trying to build a system and benchmarking it into a, into a public data set versus actually trying to build an experience uh, where thinking about the errors and how the users are using it tends to be very, very important. That said, there has been work from before and recent work on characterizing errors and characterizing generalization challenges around NL to SQL in general. But your other uh, question is about the fact that this is very contextual. It's not like, like I could ask the same question and the interpretation one time could be that it should be uh, greater than or equal to, and sometimes it should be exactly two. And this makes the problem a lot more challenging. But if you think about it, we are just making the problem harder on ourselves. Because if we assume that one shot scenario, then we are basically saying the system needs to be able to disambiguate somehow. The system, to, to do that, the system needs to be very familiar with the domain and very familiar with the person. And we're just making the problem too hard. Versus some of these ideas around and allowing the multi-shot interactive scenario as they are not only about fixing errors that the system has made. In that particular case, you could argue that this is not really an error. This is an ambiguous case. It could be interpreted right. this way or that way. And the, uh, enabling such interaction could be, a, uh, could be a way to disambiguate, could be a way even to help the users when they have an over-specified or an under-specified intent, and could be a way to solve mistakes as well. Right. And some people from the dialogue community would argue, well, you can pose a clarification question to take that ambiguity out, of course. Thank you very much. Uh, I've, I've asked something so that we can wait for more questions to come in. And now the, here is one by uh, Masahiro Sato. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Masahiro-san. How much interaction data worth one label data? Oh, hang on, I need to understand this. How much interaction data worth one label data? 100 interaction equals one label. You know what, I will paste this question in the other chat because there is some maths in it and uh, I need to figure out what is intended here. So maybe we could do this together and you have it in the chat. So there you go. Uh, 
maybe I give it to everybody in the Zoom chat to analyze as well. Yes, so how much interaction data is worth one label data? Uh, 100 interaction each one, one label. Uh, yeah, that, so that's, uh, if, if my understanding is correct, we're basically saying uh, if we have if we have, say, one label data, how many weak label data can we replace that right. one label data with and still get the best performance? And that question really depends on many things. They mostly depend on when we say the data is weak, it could be weak because it's inaccurate, it's noisy, or it could be weak for other reasons. But let's just stick with noisy and inaccurate. The noise level tends to be the main factor here. Uh, if the noise level is low, uh, then the noisy data is a lot more trusted. And that ratio between clean and, and noisy will be much smaller. If the noise level is higher, then you need much more data in order to be able to identify the signal. And some of our work, we actually did a study uh, the impact of the noise level uh, and the impact of the clean data ratio to the weak data ratio in performance. And while it's not universal, but the trend is the less noisy the weak data is, the more valuable each instance of weak labels are. Yeah, thank you very much. So, so we are we are running up to the hour. We were kind of at six o'clock. Can I ask you? Do you have your trophy uh, nearby? Could you show it to the audience? Because uh, it we have sent it to you to America already, so that we can we we'll see the proud winner with uh, the accomplishment. Congratulations again for the, winning the 2020 award. And again, uh, to the audience, if you know such a talented people out there. Uh, please nominate them. We want a rich, diverse, fabulous pool for the 2021 award, which will be presented next year. It's always one year difference. And, and please, you know, think carefully who you met, who you're working with, who you've bumped into and you were fascinated by their work. If they're within 10 years of the PhD, that's the eligibility criterion. Uh, nominate them and, and uh, promote them. It's for, for all our benefits, so we get wonderful talks like that. Congratulations again, Ahmed. Uh, I'm sure you'll hear more from you in the years to come. And thanks, everybody, for listening in. Have a great ECIR, uh, just without the Italian food. However, there is a 6 o'clock Italian cooking class coming up. Uh, I will stay on for that. Maybe you will, too. Thank you, and good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much.